Hello, Andrew here. Welcome to lecture eight in the Digital Games and Contemporary Youth Culture module. This lecture is on a youth exploitation through digital games. Um, I'm going to, it's quite a mine of information. It's a really interesting subject. Um, and there's a lot of kind of gra both grassroots and academic kind of inquiry going on and activism on the grounds of this. I'm just going to stay on the side of just the, you know, the outlining the, the you know the really dystopian aspects of it i suppose and then i'll take up on you know the different sort of movements and different um you know more positive ends of the academic theory uh, elsewhere or just leave it in the links the, the links by the way to this at the end of this lecture are probably the most substantial out of all lectures so far i literally can only kind of give a um, kind of a snapshot of a lot of the the, the, the the theory and practice that's been developed in this area um, and then just give you a lead to, to other things that are very, very interesting. So just kind of taking up on what we've covered so far, which would kind of pertain to the same ends, um, the lecture of gamification and then, you know, at a few points throughout the, the, the series of lectures we've discussed esports and just that sort of buffeting up of like a game environment or, you know, players, um, and then how that meets with industry or different sort of economies. We're going to take that all a step further now with the assumptions, much with the game, the, the gamification one of um, the assumption of, you know, this sort of a, 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 a repurposing of Taylorous, Taylorism and, you know, this sort of social science aspect of it being reapplied to marketing, essentially, to kind of pull along. With this lecture, we're going to kind of draw all that together and just pull it really into um, into physical, like mainstream culture, I suppose, and just address a lot of the um, the more abstract or hidden aspects of it. Again, like I said, which is, you know, there's an enormous amount of theory kind of looking at all that. So, you know, I, I, we, 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 we'll just throw through that as we, get, as we go. Um, and this sort of, you know, the idea of digital labor and, you know, this being, uh, you know, a, a total change in how economies and, you know, a disruption in economies and how industries and uh, work environments and workplaces are um, are changing and how that is. We're just going to look at how exploitative and you know, that that situation actually is when it comes to a worker. Um, I'm going to just, I said, I'm going to, go quite quickly through this because there's quite a bit to get through and there's a couple of videos that I want to show. This first one, I will just show a video here to wrap up the kind of gamified end and just to really underline, you know, that's kind of that take on Taylorism and not being a game environment where there's rules, boundaries and a framework imposed on that. Um, and there's this, you know, it's kind of a really loose um usurpation of game mechanics and you know the player environment applied to you know different sort of corporate environments and business you know just where business taken and, and fitting what suits um, um this video is by Brody Condon um whose work just looks at you know blends of fantasy and virtuality in everyday life and and this um this one level five is like a, 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 a one snapshot or it's an ongoing project of live action role playing events looking at the um the ideology of mass self actualization from seminars in the nineteen seventies America. So the idea of like um participants looking to achieve personal transformation um and it, it, it mirroring a kind of a corporate training environment and self-help seminar. So it, it'll just give a really sort of emotive aspect of, you know, the, these things that have remained sort of, you know, hidden to date, I hope. The time is now 11.10 and your training has begun. We have developed certain ground rules for the training that you now will agree upon following. These rules exist for one reason, because they work. When I've gone through the rules, if you can't agree to them, the door is over there, and thank you for coming. I'm going to tell you what you're going to expect in this training today. It's two parts. I talk, you talk. Right now it's I talk, I talk, and you listen. But I want to get one thing clear. 
I don't want any of you assholes to believe a word I'm saying. Get that. Don't believe it. I am the trainer and you are the trainees because my life works and yours doesn't. Your lives don't work. They don't work. You know this, they don't work. Now you have ideas about how life should go, right? You've got intelligent ideas. You've got reasonable ideas about life. And you're very reasonable in the way that you handle life and all your lives don't work. You don't have to get it right now. You don't have to understand it right now. Don't try to understand it. There's nothing to understand. Okay? I don't want you to believe a word I'm saying. You stay in the room, you follow instructions, you'll get it. You are not getting that job. You are not going to get that job if you keep it up like this. You are fucking worthless fucking fire. Nobody fucking just shit about it. You want to get up? You want to get up? You want to get up? Look at that! Look at that big man! What do you want? What do you want, big man? Tell us what you want! What do you want? Make sure you get this. You will get this. This is like a light bulb, okay? You're either in not in experience or you're in non-experience. This is plus, this is minus, right? It's a light bulb that's on or it's off. Only let them out if you believe they want you. You believe it. Boss! No! <laughs> you won't be out there. Okay, so that's quite a intense and evocative sort of um, snapshot of, you know, a, it could be, you know, a culture of intern, in, in, internships for work environments where, you know, even competitive environment towards, um, you know, being uh, entitled to work for free, essentially. And that being, you know, one sort of thing that's underpinning the, the, the culture, the, the, the working landscape and, you know, also cultural and social landscapes at the moment where, you know, this is acceptable and this is normal behaviors in particular for, for younger generations where any job that they might get, they couldn't even expect to have the same rights or, um, you know, um, job prospects or security as their, as, as, as their, their elders. Um, just to kind of round off the esports aspect of it, there's another interesting paper which I'll attach below of Tom Brock taking up on Roger Calwa's kind of uh, warning against the rationalization of play by working life, arguing the professionalization of competitive games will have a negative impact on society. So that's kind of just to take that throughout the neck the rest of it, that there's this sort of rationalization. And as Tom Brock kind of rightly, um, you know, applies to uh, you know esports that that being towards the pursuit of extrinsic rewards so you know it's already you know happening essentially that we can see that that's um that that is is very much the case um we just have this sort of you know it's a bust on the game environment and the application of conformity and productivity in a game environment removes the free will of a game environment so we see that sort of it, it kind of coming full circle where you know it, it, we, we could see some sort of assimilation of play and game environments now taking you know be, being embodied essentially in in people and how they conduct their lives or their working lives in particular um i just want to um give a few snapshots of the kind of you know that sort of plane of the world we live in where we have um you know 
a, a, a rapidly increasing human population um and you, you this being one one aspect of it where if we've a you know a, a dematerialized workplace works work and working environment as we move into like knowledge economies or more online economies um and where that deficit of be it skill sets or actual you know requirements of pe people to work jobs that are can be automated now essentially um, and where that all fits together we look at the, the chart there on the left of the number of hours per week needed to produce as much work as a 40-hour worker in 1950 is you know research would have that down to a, a, tw a, a, a 21 hour a week so we can see how um drastically the technologies and the automated sort of work um, has has increased productivity as much and reduced the number of hours needed to do it. On the other side, we can just see, you know, that sort of drastic statistic of, you know, human labor and historically it being wageless for vast majorities of, you know, people in the world who could never expect to in enjoy regular salaries or any sort of security that might come with that. So, you know, this is just kind of want to indicate that this is something which is like increasing rather than a phenomena which has been um, just uncovered, I suppose. So uh, just again, to kind of get a snapshot of the working landscape at the moment where we just have underpayment, you know, when we look at digital labor, we'll see this very clearly next of that being a, um, a key part of like a, a sharing economy or, you know, a crowdsourced economy that you can, you can get work done cheaper in in that sort of environment in an online virtual environment or divvy up a job amongst more people and you know pay them less there's alienation from both employers and co-workers um, again we'll describe that later on the unwaged digital labor um, you know which we'll speak about in relation to playboy or just more with a computer gaming economy um, and you know fan sort of labor or, you know, these sort of elements are a big thing. Just in the more legal sense of it, the transnational disregard of human rights and welfare rights being something that um, has allowed this to go unchecked to date, really, because it is a really drastic, um, you know, situation um, that hasn't been checked legally in any when it comes to any sort of, you know, workers' rights or workers' movements towards that. Um, the abdication of the role of employer and re redefinition of the employee, this kind of swings back towards the, the gamified market spiel of it, where, you know, there's a whole set of, a semantic set of new words and terminology, which can remove, um, any sort of legal implication that would come with defining yourself as an employer or an employee. And, um, you kind of, you know, that, that, that being a, a gross sort of negligence on behalf of, you know, a lot of these companies. So we look here, we see um, just the kind of mark and underline um, people who are actually working in the productivity of certain technologies, in this case, smartphones and tablets, like we have the Foxconn workers in, in China who, um, you know, have had numerous ongoing and pretty high level protests and walkouts in relation to trying to establish better workers' rights for themselves and their employees. And then also, you know, the 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 the, the miners um, who are taking, you know, in Congo, taking rare earth metals out of the ground for um, that that are vital parts of building smartphones and um, basis of our digital lifestyle, you know. So there's a really interesting documentary on that called Blood in the Mobile, which kind of profiles the the, the, the role of um, a company like Nokia in particular in those sorts of environments. So we can see that that's, um, that, you know, in the physical sense of actually making these, you know, in the traditional sense of making a product, even before we look at digital labor, that, uh, you know, the, the, the roots of it look kind of a bit rotten at the moment. Um, and if we just kind of put that back to a, a graph I would have showed you earlier, it's just kind of where I would have spoken about, you know, the price of a smartphone in your pocket ha having kind of a net worth of almost a million dollars. Um, obviously, when we look at it this way, there's a bit of a price to pay, um, which simply seems to be the case. So um, I'm just going to show the next video about just the, it's going to just give a snapshot of how actively and, you know, um, 
deliberately there's been a reworking of labor laws um at a global level by a lot of these transnational corporations so um we just move on to this trevor schultz video here before the tsunami hits you know how it is the sea recedes leaving a dead desert in which only cynicism and dejection remain all you need to do is to make sure you have the right words to say the right clothes to wear before it finally wipes you away at first glance, the situation in southern France and the United States seems to prove Franco Bifo Berardi right. The suicide rate in these parts of uh, Europe and in the US, especially among the middle-aged, has sharply increased during the time of the Great Depression that unfolded over the last uh, six years. Some people here in the audience may still remember the suicides of many East Germans when the Socialist Republic imploded. Incredible uh, precarious economic pressures lead to personal despair. But uh, precarity isn't an individual problem and such grand exit leaves no opportunity for alternative path. What is put to question by Berardi and also Peter Fleming and others is the possibility of alternative path, of a commons within capitalism, of digital labor that is worth defending and we just heard about this from Net's politic of the comments within capitalism of digital labor at startups that we should be building up and that of projects that we should invest in and so what i want to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to make it abundantly clear where i found exploitative emerging forms of labor but also talk about peer-to-peer -peer labor that is worth celebrating investing in and supporting so to show you both sides of this landscape. Um, I will tell you, I just can't help it, but I uh, become outraged about the way in which the blossoming industries uh, of the crowdsourcing industry are wiping away 100 years of labor struggle for the eight hour workday, for paid vacation, health insurance against child labor, from the hay market riots to the strike at the Ford River Rouge plant in 1945. All of this wiped away seemingly overnight by platforms like Mechanical Turk and others. My interventions range from a call of much needed new concept and theories to practical proposals. I'm offering all this from a position of an author, an artist and an educator who is equally uh, interested in theory and in making stuff, making projects starting projects. It was just uh, two weeks ago when we learned about Savar, Bangladesh, where five garment factories filled with workers who were paid 20 cents an hour and produced clothes for brands like Calvin Klein collapsed. When the building on Rama Plaza that housed these factories collapsed, the death toll soared to 517 immediately making this the biggest disaster in the history of the garment industry. The factory owner who was warned about the lack of structural integrity of the building was hiding cowardly in a suburb and nobody really knows where Calvin Klein was that day or what he had to say about it. And here in Germany, even if it's not quite as bleak, you get a taste of this brave new world of labor that is literally killing people as well. Just think of the recent scandal at Amazon DE, which employed a security company named after Adolf Hitler's deputy Rudolf Hess to look after the 5,000 part-time workers, mostly with migration backgrounds in its biggest warehouse in Germany. That's just something unsettling about German guards with military haircuts, leather boots, and in tour Steiner designer in uniforms, telling workers from Bulgaria or Poland that they are the police around here, while blinding them with the headlights of their truck. It's of course part of good business uh, for Amazon to fire Hess security, but you know, let's not forget that it took German public television to make that happen. Interestingly, also Documenta now recalled strange experiences with Hess security. The Melbourne native company 99design doesn't really employ right-wing radicals, but uh, one of its three headquarters is in Berlin, and the company is very active in the German design market. 
99 Design offers competitive crowdsourcing for designers. Currently, the company has a pool of 200,000 registered designers. So, for example, if you are a client who is looking for a logo, you might spend the very reasonable sum of $300. And for that, you receive 116 completely executed design, as the designer and researcher Florian Schmidt explained. But of these 116 designs, only one will receive payment, and it's a payment of $180. And I'm not sure if I have to spell this out, but uh, that means that 115 designers worked for free. And we are not paid at all. And you don't have to be a math genius to understand that this means that $120 went to the intermediary, the company that connects workers with those who are looking for work, 99designs. 99designs states that it ran 180,000 of those crowdsourced competitions that are, of course, global in nature. Not only do wages hit rock bottom, but degrees in design, decades of experience, reputation, uh, and of course the cost itself are cut out of the equation and any talented students in a dorm room uh, in an art college in Shanghai is now competing for the same job. Uh, what it means to be a designer then has completely changed. But those who think that uh, working conditions don't matter in the social democracy that is Germany should also meditate on the 400,000 academic student assistants who are either underpaid or not paid at all. They live on the hope that things will turn out for the better one day, and if they don't, well, then they already got used to the precariousness of their work life. In corporate America and academia, the equivalent is the unpaid student intern. Ross Perlin, a professor at NYU, estimated that unpaid student internships generated financial benefit for corporate America of about $2 billion a year. But it is true, if compared to other countries like China, India, Russia, and the United States, Germany is at least thus far less affected by the dark side of digital labor. But nobody should say that precarious digital labor doesn't exist in Germany. And let's not make a mistake about it worldwide, for millions of people, digital environments have become their daily grind and yet are invisible to us. So they are, we don't see these workers, they don't see each other, they don't see their employer. And uh, we need to give a face to these work practices. So I think it is incredibly important to make those work practices visible. Employers have become linguistic spin masters that make up all kinds of interesting new words, including requesters, task rabbits, cloud workers, one of my favorites, pro uh, providers and crowd workers, just to make sure that they're not thought of as employers and to make you forget that this is actually work and not just a game that you play instead of watching television. They might have even taken a cue from the German term Arbeitgeber, which is really equally turning work reality on its head. If I call you a cloud worker, you are still a worker and your stomach will, gil will still get hungry come lunchtime and your eyes will still feel strained and your back might hurt after long screen-bound hours. And you're also a citizens, citizen with some rights that come with that. You're not just a cloud worker. The deceptive language used by many of these companies is aiming to make you forget all that and suggest that something completely new is happening here. In many cases, however, digital labor continues traditional sweatshop economies. And I don't say that easily, as I mean it by the word. I can talk about that later. This deceptive language game is also important for the legal advisors of these companies who know how important it is to call their workers employees, <clears throat> not to call their workers employees, because employees have rights, such as minimum wage standards, paid vacation, health insurance. They are independent contractors, they say, and while this is an assertion that has never been tested in any court, it is also a convenient position to allow them not to take care of their workers while still getting, as filmmaker Alex Rivera put it in his brilliant film, Sleep Dealer, all the work without the worker. Okay, so yeah, quite a stark sort of breakdown of things there. Um... 
just in re- mostly in relation to that total abdication of you know uh, l- the legal responsibilities or you know what had been worked for in workers rights movements or you know every level of um you know human rights movements um next to the the, the amount of capital which has been gained by the this in, it's essentially an enslavement of people into into this sort of um culture of working and that sort of semant- the use of semantic words like uh you know content generators writing for exposure um you know student internships as discussed there and community contributors all these things have kind of you know have that sort of the same grammar of a, like a gamified aspect of it where you know it's it's it sounds co- nice and comfortable yeah but as we can see it's quite stark and people do um you know live by this and uh you know suffer under it as well so we want to do i just want to talk about this the 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 um the, the work done by trevor schultz and because this was the defining thing really i suppose of digital labor pulling this sort of um whole area together where um there's an enormous amount of as i said academic and kind of grassroots level work all kind of collated in the book in the first place and then on the website as well well worth to watch every one of these people um contributing to this is coming with a real academic thrust and you know uh, from a grassroots indigenous organizations with it as well so it's super interesting work that's going on um across the board there um just pull out one or two other examples like I, that, that whole lecture is well worth to watch by itself but just take up amazon's mechanical turk um working environments and just give the kind of proof of concept of this way of like crowdsourcing labor um if you the example given is if you need 3000 images captions it's cheaper to pay 3000 people 1 cent rather than to pay one person to caption 3000 images so you know that just shows what the the technology and the automation is allowing for this sort of you know um you know um abdications of of responsibilities and rights uh, while at the same time appearing to just offer a platform for people and if we're looking kind of easy and kind of informal, whereas the reality is there are 80% of the people using that um, particular platform, Mechanical Turk, to, to make a living on an average salary of $2 a day. So, you know, that it, it, can, it does amount to slave labour and does that alienation from an employer and isolated from each other and pitted against each other essentially um is all you know things that do feed back into that sort of competitive edge of um a game environment really taken taken full full um full circle so um just to bring it back to the games um and just that sort of logic and the rationale that goes with it um we look at Julian Kuklik's work uh, on modding, essentially, where, you know, the, this the, what he picked up on, I think I discussed a little bit earlier in another lecture, but it was the, um, the, 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 the Valve offering um, the use of the um, Half-Life engine as like an S, as, as a development kit for its players to kind of mod out the game and do that. But... Um, while while Valve had bought the the engine, the game engine, the Half Life engine, they did have like a an end of a, a, you know in a, a ter- terms of you know it, users agreement with that. So um, basically, it, it boils down that the, the the players would be generating the um, the the players would be generating content for the company essentially because there was no ownership over it and they were literally leasing the the, the half life engine to play with so cook this is kind of the cornerstone of Kuklik's kind of um, take on the play labor and how this is combined and you see this kind of ambiguous um quote which he puts over it accurately of it's it's not work but it's not not work so it is kind of operating in a, a really sort of odd space where you have people who do see the novel trivial side of these things next to people who are actually trying to live and work and just those sort of the grammar and the boundaries of all that sit next to the legal ease of it in a really uncomfortable way we'll uh, go to julian kuklik talking about it Uh, now and then come back after that.
Our next uh, presenter will be Julian Kuklish, uh, talking about the ideology of play. I'm going to talk about the concept of playbird, which, um, as a term, um, has gained uh, unfortunate or fortunate um, currency, um, and which I, for better or for worse, uh, coined or helped to coin um, with my work uh, on digital digital games and the way that they're being produced. Um, so, to introduce this talk, I'd uh, like to introduce uh, this character on the screen here. Um, which um, does anybody know who that is? Um, can anybody identify that icon? Okay, uh, it's it's Manic Miner. Um, he's like the working class hero of. Uh, the, the video game generation, um, um, and of course, Manic Miner has a direct uh, direct relationship with the um, with the miner strike in the UK um, in the nineteen eighties. Um, so it is, and this kind of secret history of the way that uh, play and labor are sort of interrelated um, in. The video game and the medium of the video game that I'm interested in, um, and I started thinking about this in the context of a computer game modification, um, of which you see one of the earliest examples here. Um, computer game modification basically takes an existing video game um, and, and changes either the code or the graphics um, or both, um, so it ranges from fairly cosmetic representational changes to the game to so-called total conversions um, of which uh, the game Counter-Strike would be um, the most well-known example which is a modification of the game Half-Life um, but completely changes uh, the gameplay itself and uh, the representational form. Um, what you he see here is uh, of course a modification of Castle Wolfenstein um, which uh, which has been changed into Castle Smurfenstein. Um, I won't delve into that um, in too much detail. Um, what I'm really interested in is what modding actually is and how it works. Um, I became interested in modding because um, it is, um, of course, very closely related to the intellectual property regimes that games are embedded in. Um, and what that means is that the work that the modders, uh, people who modify video games, put into these modifications usually ends up being um, the property of uh, the people who produce the games in the first place. So um, yeah, it's not entirely cut and dry, but um, usually the end user license agreement uh, that you click through when you install the game uh, pretty much puts it in uh, very clear terms that whatever you do with that uh, game is going to end up being the property of the original producer of that game. Um, so in a very uh, simple and fairly naive uh, point of looking at it would of course just be as a form of textual poaching where uh, you use uh, an existing cultural text and you sort of change its representational qualities and you, know, you can sort of tweak it in certain ways to uh, fit your own agenda or you know, uh, simply just to play around with the way that the game presents itself to its users. So this range has been all the way from Castle Smurfenstein to uh, more activist uh, mods like uh, Escape from Woomera, which engages with the uh, with the situation of uh, of asylum seekers in uh, in Australia, um, and puts the user into 
the shoes, as it were, um, of one of those uh, interns in a re in a refugee camp uh, in the in the Australian desert. Um, and then, of course, um, Tiziana Terranova has been credited a number of times already. Um, there is this concept of free labor that seems quite well suited to describe this sort of phenomenon um, where people, just because they can, basically, um, take um, an existing game and uh, change it in a certain way, which then um, is, of course, not just... Um, uh, a form of, of extended play, you might say, um, where you use the game um, to different ends than the designers might have had in mind, but you're still engaging with it playfully. But at the same time, um, it is a form of, we could say, productive play, where uh, the, the product itself is in an intertextual relationship with the original work. Um, and that's what uh, David Marshall calls, uh, th that's why he thinks video games are the perfect example of what he calls the intertextual commodity, um, where you, know, um, you have a sort of source work, um, but then you have a network of other uh, instances of that work, and uh, all these instances sort of work together to create something um, that is... And, um, more more pertinent um, and in a, in a way more durable than the original work um, because like many other cultural products video games are of course um, usually high-risk products that um, either sell within the first six weeks of their being published or they don't sell at all um, so this is basically a way a way of extending the shelf life um, of these games and of course you know, they work as free marketing they um, work up some sort of buzz around the game you need the original game to play the mods so you know, it is um, basically adding value to an existing product um, and of course the mode um, of doing that and of, in, of enabling uh, that is through a form of crowdsourcing um, which means that you're basically just offering a platform to people in which they can uh, then base their own uh, creative labor. Um, and yeah, I mean, in many in many cases, it's also a waste of time, which uh, I think is uh, is important. Um, Roger Cairo speaks about play um, as an occasion of pure waste, which I find a very elegant definition uh, of what play is. But maybe that definition is also historically contingent. I think that's you know, something that often gets erased or forgotten when we speak about play and work and labor and games. That you know, These are, of course, uh, not, um, not uh, eternally um, valuable or internally existing concepts, but you know, they get redefined, they get um, reconceptualized in various ways. And I think you know, the, the, the term flavor is also meant to convey that sense of a shifting relationship between um, terms that may con uh, historically be seen as uh, fairly uh, occupying opposite ends of, uh, of a spectrum. Okay, so we'll cut that there. Um, it, it just to kind of outline the sort of the, the modding aspect of it. And mostly, you know, he does really en show enlighten on that, um, you know, that key thing of the, the buffeting up against the ambiguous legal terrain, really, or ownership, essentially, of how that all sort of boils down. And, you know, the, the kind of the pitch from companies really being that this is a... Um, you know, a playful, fun thing for someone to do and to involve themselves with, but not really, you know, applying that to the end user's license agreements and showing you just exactly how limited it is and where the ownership lies. So, you know, the, the, the company basically has free labor and free work and different iterations on its product, essentially coming back to it for free, um, which is the vital thing here. Um, so, 
we look at, and this is being rolled out across the board really in terms of software development kits where pretty much every app, phone, and new technology would come with that for for you know a community to refine and evolve a product really um but not have any ownership over it when it comes to the to the crunch so that's kind of the vital aspect of that um we just want to look at the um this idea of participation really then and uh just to see where you know if we if the if the the ownership isn't there well then where does the what, it, it, how can it be presented as this sort of participatory play, play, place from the companies in particular where the you know you can participate in a product you can add to it you can enhance it you can build communities around it but you have no ownership over it so andrew ross kind of knocks that flat on its on its face really with some really uh, stark examples of just how um you know how 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 close it is related to you know class exploitation and, and, and a surplus of value which is the vital thing which makes this all look a bit strange in a digital virtual iterative age where you know everything can be kind of mass produced as a digital kind of entity so it's surplus value being a kind of an, an interesting concept there um this is an, it, one sort of chart from 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 one of his uh, from that sorry the previous one the class and exploitation on the internet, just giving you a, a breakdown of you know a Google search for political news and just showing just how controlled and you know owned that actually is in terms of the top hits for that. He runs all the way through different sort of social medias about that and just shows just the prevalence of it where what is kind of um private profit over public good um willing out in every single one of those domains you know so you know that participatory nature of it really is 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 a is a is a, is a bogus argument and it's just presented in that sort of same marketing spiel that we would have seen from the the gamification essentially um Again, just a step further into all this now, because it's it, 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 it not if we think of it in terms of just the gamification um, next to these sort of like modding and you know um, you know users and communities you know being being used to develop products on a community around that and all that being at very least just a good marketing um, spin to put on things. Um, we just want to bring that even further into the into the real domain with um the, the, we we just go to the next um lecture with Tiziana Terranova speaking along these sorts of lines and linking it further along you know labor movements and stuff like this okay let's start with uh, uh, the 90s again and if you're looking at, um, at the internet in the um, 90s mid 90s late 90s early 2000s it really didn't take much it didn't take data science to figure out what was going on I mean, that was very clearly stated. There was quite a lot of debate about where the internet was going, following the lift on commercial ban in the late in the early 1990s, and uh, the state statements were pretty regular statements. Go as Foucault uh, told us, uh, they all uh, talked about the centrality, the centrality of user-generated content and services. Uh, that was before the Web 2.0. Uh, speech by Tim O'Reilly, which uh, solidified uh, that kind of tendency and uh, made it popular with venture capitalists and entrepreneurs interested in making money out of this new uh, context. So user-generated content and services was key. Uh, the, the, all the talk was about get as many people as you can uh, to contribute to your projects, to put content on your platforms, and even if you're losing money, even if you're losing massive amount of money, it doesn't matter because that growth, that growth in use already signals future earnings. So they will come. So we know that most of these social web giants actually lost a lot of money before they started making money. And that promise that growth of the user base was part of, you know, absolutely crucial to, uh, to, to the value you know, that they generated, even if it's a promise of future, of future returns. Another thing that was very visible was also that open, open source software was making ripples as a, a new mo a production model of the economy. So that was quite clear. I think it's early 2000 that Yokai Benkler publishes his first essay about uh, uh, social production. 
um, I think he calls it, I think he uses a different name maybe at the time, um, I should check. Anyway, that became his book, The Wealth of Networks, in uh, 2006, I think. And uh, it's, um, I think uh, the whole book is an attempt, and it's quite clear about uh, that, to translate this new process, this new phenomenon, voluntary coordination, uh, without, which doesn't go through the monetary system, through the price uh, mechanism of the market, or through the management hierarchies of the firm, and still manages to produce something of value. You know, how is that possible? So it's a whole translation of the process into the language and categories of neoclassical economics, which prepares the ground for the kind of absorption of parts of the open source movement into these big corporate platforms, which uh, use the kind of hybrid model, they all use partly open source uh, software. And also what was quite visible uh, again in these uh, writings, uh, which I was reading as a literature student, <laughs> used to text uh, very much, so kind of extracting uh, uh, meanings out of them, is that uh, uh, the notion of a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, of equipotentiality, as peer-to-peer -peer theorist, my good friend Michelle Bowens uh, put it, uh, was uh, um, susceptible to becoming uh, being configured as this kind of power law topology uh, where with time um, you had this huge concentration of uh, quantities of, of value on in certain parts of the network the big heads but at the same time you had this kind of long tail of infinite variation uh, where which was uh, also important to draw in so the combination of kind of big head or big concentration joining huge amounts of tiny variation was also fundamental to the success in this new business environment. And there was the press and there were the websites and there were the videos, everything was pointing in that direction. What happened since is what we're really talking about uh, today in this context uh, has been uh, the user-generated content once it has become the focus of valorization, it's become the, the object of uh, uh, great investments uh, and continuous uh, uh, innovation and reinvention to the point where we are today where it's materialized in something that again, excuse my kind of uh, passion for science fiction, uh, we could call a social automaton, a social network automaton factory, a social uh, automaton and network factory, uh, a hybrid of the social and the automation, which produces a huge amount of value in contemporary uh, network economy. So uh, we can talk about this new kind of machinery. Uh, Karl Marx in Fragment of Machines uh, talks about machinery as the natural evolution of the means of labor uh, once it becomes a form of fixed capital and it's employed in production. It says the tendency is towards making uh, machines, the tools, a machine, and then the machine a system or a machinery, which is like a self-moving automaton with uh, workers constituting a small less conscious linkages uh, in, the, in this production uh, process. Uh, this, uh, um, this machinery has become a kind of a social machinery, uh, what we might call the social network dispositive, where every social act, acts that we were familiar with before, we used to like things, listen, reading, comment, uh, chat before social networks, but now these acts have become, become part of a new machinery, of a new automata, uh, made of mechanisms, of rules, uh, which are reiterated as a typical form of software, you know, this kind of reiteration. And there's also new things that we didn't know what, uh, you know, about that we're doing now, like tweeting, uh, blogging, uh, digging, uh, you know, and all these uh, uh, adjectives, these verbs, these predicates, which define our identities uh, for databases in, in social networks. All these, uh, all these social acts are now uh, abstracted and then potentially part of a process of monetization. They become translated into, into money. Uh, I'm also uh, grateful to the work that Caroline and Anne Helmond is here in the audience uh, and other people working on uh, digital methods and computational culture have done to elucidate uh, both the actual technical details, which are very interesting, of all these technologies, because most of them are actually hidden. There is a kind of a front 
which is very visible, and then there's all this machinery behind, which we are hardly aware of. So it's very important to actually keep tracking or keep mapping the evolution of this machinery uh, because it's very hidden and most people are not... Um, um, it's hidden, it's, it's, it's kind of secret, but it can be uh, reconstructed, uh, fascinated by the, what happened to the hyperlink. Uh, if you consider again uh, the origin of the hyperlink, a kind of literature endeavor with Ted Nelson, and, or, and then with Tim Berners-Lee, it was about linking documents mainly. So it was about making documents uh, um, available and accessible in a network of scientists. And then we see uh, that the hyperlink now has become, as Anne told us, a dynamic rich data object. And the link is basically not linking so much document as what, again, citing Marx, we might call the social individual, although it's a strange social individual. It's an only social individual defined by its profile page, uh, where one has collected everything that one likes, everything, all the one's connections, you know, all the different data, the wall, the home page, uh, central part of the social machinery are social patterns and plugins. Uh, there are immediate mechanisms of social quantification and recentralization of the internet. I have um, um, had a fascination for the like button uh, for ages. I think it's a really good uh, uh, starting point to start looking at what well, are the mechanisms of capture work, work and what is it that they ca capture. And also, uh, I think quite interesting, uh, and I've been looking at this uh, using Bernard Reader's work and then expanding it uh, by looking back at the social network analysis literature, which comes from the social sciences uh, very much, to see how this technology or this technique, which is the social graph, uh, which is what uh, uh, Facebook uses uh, as a mode of organization of uh, data, uh, to see how the social graph has got this kind of longer biopolitical uh, uh, genealogy uh, which makes it uh, a kind of technology of securitization of the social you know, the tendency of social network analysis to bring everything back to order and how i think this has been instantiated in uh, uh, social the, the actual construction of social network technologies which are like always inciting events and always kind of reabsorbing them back so every event is a spike of activity, but everything must be kind of stabilized within this open series, which is the social uh, network. So again, very interesting talk. Um, well worth watching in its entirety. A lot of interesting work going on in Italy as well. It's a disregard, especially as regards the social factory and different sort of takes on it. Just to pick up on two points there. Um, one being this this truism of like um, you know the imbalanced economic model from the outset of companies startups requiring capitalization before profit so this sort of data retrieval device being you know one sort of um factor of that and you know commodifying that essentially but what we really have is like a sort of a rushing Russian doll scenario where you have that competitive capitalist model to get capitalized um holding all the you know the be it the internships or the different sort of digital labor models with inside that so it's kind of like uh, compounding a nightmare essentially you know with that so um the other thing being this concept of optimization which you know one thing being the social phenomena which tiziana turnover described there of like um kind of having peaks or trending and then all that sort of being sort of, you know, regulated again within the model. And that being kind of something which is probably a bit dangerous or well worth commenting on in a, in a social cultural sort of sense of it, you know, but also the concept of optimization, which would have um, big data being used as a tool or, and a function like that, you know, and, um, it is it being a, a constant improving ground and something which is constantly moving and shifting and is has this sort of pseudo effect of being dynamic over the top of it and um how how people it, it demands that people interact with it essentially that being a kind of key vital thing or it can kind of go on in the backgrounds in a lot of respects which is um you know another end and we look at like the internet bots and just this kind of same concept of it, if we look at the, the breakdown of, um, you know, they're, they're 
this sort of cleaning devices and things that are going on around it but it's all beneath the surface it's all kind of collecting and trolling sort of true data so it's how much of it's useful how much of it's liberating and how much of it's enslaving um so you can look at bots in two ways really one is the the shop steward on the factory floor if we're talking social factories or the, the cables and the um in the concentration camps if we're talking in enslaving sort of aspect of it so i just wanted to comment on that because this is again something it's all very legal gray area essentially and it's only when it gets challenged that we'll really see um where all this kind of fits um we just want to talk about you know the the, the concept of the reworking of free and that sort of semantic sense as well that we've you know just discussed about like the the you know the, the disregard of the abdication of responsibilities by companies and the defining of employer employees and likewise with the word free and um, trevor Scholes, this is really eloquent if you ask me it's just if you are not paying for the service chances are you are the product so that's kind of um you know again looking at like the um the end users agreements and stuff like this where there's just a lot of stuff that's kind of passed uh, you know, willy nilly on the back, and you know, people have kind of em entered into it. But you know, it, it obviously it does have a, a a more of a kind of there's definitely more con con connotations going on there than 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 meet the eye. So likewise, you know, in the marketing sense or in the business sense of what we're looking at for that data retention, but also to kind of build a profile of of an of a of a of a customer you know we talk about lead generations then and this again we're especially with you in terms of young people or youth culture we can see that this is like a vital part of um pulling people in and drawing them in and then monetizing it thereafter or building a community or you know workers essentially all these sorts of different ends of it serving the same end but um the the free aspect and making making it appealing and drawing people in being the vital part this is really played out in a key way with casual gamers with say games inside um facebook and the like where you know you have to unlock certain things and you know you have to kind of it becomes monetized after a while or you know especially with like um preschool sort of social media or younger people's social media interactions where you know you you can you can join the um pop star planet or you know the um you can you you can play any one of these sort of like wonderland fantasy fairground games yet you need to join up for membership essentially and that's where the the parents kind of um credit card comes in handy after a while with that um so you know it's just uh to, to kind of look at the overall thing like this it's like the the gift economy and it's just you know there has to be a kind of a, a kickback to this because it's not something that people would have just done you know um there is a virtuous user i suppose and there's these elements of like a sharing economy it didn't come from nowhere and the crowdsourcing and the sort of social phenomenon phenomenon of these things that do come out of like say more marxist ends of um you know interactions rather than naive people walking off the edge of a cliff like lemmings and you know so just to kind of mark on that as well that you know the, the, where is the kickback or the understanding of that which is probably not yet happened and we'll discuss well it is it's in the offing in many different ways but it hasn't been kind of considered fully and there's been something that is you know brooding essentially and you know due a uh due its stay really so i just wanted to mark, remark on this from richard barbrook and the high-tech gift economy really so you know talking about people who are unconcerned about copyright they give and receive information without thought of payment in the absence of states or markets to mediate social bonds networks communities are instead formed through mutual obligations created by gifts of time and ideas so that's essentially what you know tim berners lee and the 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 steams of the origins of the internet were was meant to give likewise with computer games for like a play and fun environment so it just gives us a measure of how far this has been kind of pulled in the wrong directions um and that being something which um you know is probably overdue being readdressed and something that you know the more dematerialized things become the more labor becomes like a precarious situation and this is challenged all these things will kind of have their day essentially um but again i just want to show 
a drastic picture of how far this has gone in terms of um, our lack of understanding with that, really. Looking for trouble? Nearly 70 years after it was first published, George Orwell's dystopian sci-fi novel 1984 is, to this day, still held up as the gold standard for what an authoritarian police state underpinned by an all-pervasive surveillance apparatus would look like. But let's be real. Who needs Big Brother when you've got Facebook and Google? Contemporary techniques of mass data collection and analysis combined with a society where more and more of our communications take place through heavily controlled and completely monitored corporate infrastructure has produced a framework for social control that would have made Orwell throw up in his mouth. The world was given a terrifying glimpse of the true potential of this unholy alliance of state and corporate power in 2011 as the Gulf states were putting the finishing touches on the Arab Spring protests in Bahrain. After a Saudi-led occupation force viciously put down the revolutionary uprising, the Bahraini royal family used Facebook to launch a wide-ranging witch hunt of activists, posting pictures of pro-democracy rallies and urging pro-regime loyalists to name and tag people in the pictures, in a mass doxing campaign that resulted in waves of targeted arrests and disappearances. Yes, the future is here, comrades. Angry responses only. The term signals intelligence seems to come out of earlier histories of, of spying and communication, where it was like classic Cold War between the US and Russia. Telecommunications, especially hard to decipher or hidden telecommunications, was not used very widely. And with computers becoming widespread and computers being able to do the math for encryption, increasingly the ways people are organizing and communicating with each other is happening through these computerized means. So the part of their social control apparatus that is dedicated to signal intelligence, this like gathering of information that's happening electronically, is just ballooning. You can think of the type of surveillance that they are done by these agencies in two different forms. They do mass surveillance, which is gathering all the data they can, storing it, trying to analyze it, and look at metadata. That's for like hundreds of millions or billions of people all over the world and what their communications are. And then they also do targeted surveillance, which is really different. That's like hacking into things or trying to find a way to compromise an encryption system so that they can then read what people think is being protected. These sorts of attacks were, are way more expensive. This is why mass surveillance has become really important because they can do it really, really widely for relatively lower cost. Facebook and social media in general has been a treasure trove of information for the government and for corporations. These types of platforms are a way of instantly getting snapshots of your network, who your friends are, who you talk to, what events you're going to, and they, they help facilitate more targeted attacks. Facebook is probably the worst out there. Government and corporations can literally look at all your friend groups and plot out maps of how different networks are connected to each other, and they use that information for conspiracy allegations, for RICO allegations, as well as finding weak links within those networks to target. The companies are better at gathering data. They have set up whole web infrastructure pretty much dedicated to gathering as much information as possible about people for profit for advertising reasons. Google, in its terms of use, says that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy when you use any of their products, including Gmail. So basically that means nothing that you do in that platform is yours, and they can do whatever they want with it. They basically say, hey, know that we're giving all of your shit to the government, and we're going to use the shit to spy on you some more, too. That's not disputed that this is the relationship. Facebook also has facial recognition software for all those photos and videos that you post. North Dakota and Dapple used that facial recognition on Facebook in order to issue arrest warrants for people and literally arrested and charged people with crimes based on video and photographs that activists posted. Protest prediction software has been developed and is currently being used primarily in Latin American countries. By monitoring Facebook and other social media, this software predicts when riots or protests or public uprisings may happen up to three days in advance. We have more direct confrontation right now with the state. And so we think of things in state terms, the capacity of the state has for repression and for social control broadly. And that makes sense. But surveillance capitalism is creating 
whole new forms of social control that don't even depend on the state. I mean, they're still built on the foundation of the of prisons and everything else that already exists, but they're doing a whole other level of thing that and the state is kind of trying to use and catch up with, but isn't primarily behind and even isn't really necessarily that good at doing. One really important aspect of it is that the degree to which it is marketed as voluntary, that everybody chooses to get a Facebook account and you have the option of not having a Facebook account. But the way the society is being structured, there's less and less real choice involved in whether we have a Facebook account or whether we have a cell phone. Your cell phone, especially your smartphone, is probably one of the largest vulnerabilities that you have as an activist. It's got your photographs, your contacts, your calendar, your email. You know, every aspect of your life can often be contained on this phone. Phones actually have two computers running in them. There's the main computer, and that can be mostly running free software. Then there's a second computer called the baseband, and it connects to the cell phone towers. That part of the phone is running software that we don't control at all. It seems, at least in some cases, that the tower has control of the phone via the baseband. And often the baseband kind of can just override the main CPU. Even if you turn off the phone, your phone can be used to locate you. It can be used as a microphone and or a camera. And you really have no sure way of knowing whether any of those things are occurring, even if you turn off the phone. And then the, the tower is obviously controlled completely by the telecom companies who are working closely with the state, or more directly, via stingrays, which are the things that police agencies are buying up all over the place that create a fake cell phone tower that the phones connect to, and then they get direct access. Okay, again, quite a bleak dystopian outlook on things there when you look at you know taken to its logical end of technologies being applied for um you know it's one thing for it to be applied for corporate gain and just like you know in terms of a you know a, a company sort of trying to find a niche in a market it's a whole other thing for it to be applied to like you know mass surveillance of society and social control so that's the kind of it's where that sort of um where that conversation goes next is the possibly the vital one, you know, of um, of uh, what we're faced with. So this in the you know post Snowden um, web and, and and the cultures that come with that. These are like you know some of the ramifications that we're met with and are you know uh, people have there's a broader awareness in one respect to that. So that's something to be to be said. Um, just to speak on a few other points of towards the you know the breakdown of that of the the alienation of um of an individual in these things and you know to sound and turn over talking about like the the url and you know people in social media environments and being met with a wall where you have to kind of present yourself in a certain way so one thing is like disowning your personal information through the, uh, the objectification of an set of processes which we see there from technologically or you know um just using um complying with um, end user agreements the other thing is the subjective one which is you know um negotiating your identity and how you are perceived as well and posture of that and avatars all these things that do relate to kind of play game environments again that looks somewhat decidedly naive when we look at the gravity that it has here you know and then the other form of alienation a big key one is the complete removal of the sum of the parts so here we look at the capture project to you know people kind of to um you know do a human check and um you know for a, a login or just for security setting and at the same time translating you know books that couldn't be digitized so in one sense it looks like that sort of altruistic sort of you know um really you know virtuous user again and at the other breath it's like you don't have you see one word so you don't have any idea of the full picture or the sum of those parts at all so that being like a, a, a really big alienating device with that um another thing being like the aspirational end of it and where it's all being pushed towards and the branding of self which when we talk about what you know this being kind of like a, a, a side effect from the the alienation of of your your individual self in this environment and having to kind of take on personas or whatever and, and that being kind of fostered and encouraged by any amount of marketing is the you know the entrepreneur in these like newly emerging economies 
so you have the digitally formed concept of yourself like a youtuber um you know like pewdiepie here or a second life property tycoon like ansi chung who became the first online personality to achieve a net worth ex exceeding one million dollars from power profits entirely made inside a virtual world so you know there's this sort of culture championing these people and um these endeavors and showing them to be like almost the new norm rather than the exception and something that's kind of quite freak and um, says an awful lot about where the marketing and the drive really is for this um and then we're left back where you know where we began with young people and this sort of like generational shift and all these things and it affecting young people and their sort of prospects prospects and outlook on life more than than anyone else i suppose so that being a key vital thing for you know a global change in that direction um next lecture will be on games emerging technologies and social movements and it will pick up on like the, the other side of that all the interesting work that has is being um done and different sort of movements going on and um, trying to reconnect you know um a culture not based on wage work but on the values of future potentials and social cooperation so um yeah, we'll take that up there. And sorry for running over. Any questions, please send me an email during the week. Um, and uh, yeah, I shall talk to you all again very soon, I'm sure. Okay, cheers. Bye.